it's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. This week's interview is an epic one. It's our first Oscar-nominated guest and BAFTA winner, that's the British Oscars, Joe Alves. Joe is a legend in the film industry, famous for drawing the concept art and building the shark for Jaws. Then later on, he directed Jaws 3D. I have to let you know about his website, joealvesmovieart.com, where he sells signed storyboard art from his career. And he also has a book called Designing Jaws on Amazon right now. So go buy it. And I'll put the links in the episode notes so you can check it out. Joe has stories that'll make your jaw drop. This guy has worked with Walt Disney, Alfred Hitchcock, Elvis Presley, Steven Seagal, too many name here, so you're gonna have to listen to the episode. Here is the amazing Joe Elves. What what our podcasts? What it, what we focus on mostly is movie sequels. I know you've worked on a couple of those. All right, uh, yeah, sequels. Well, I did a couple of those. Yeah. So, uh, where do you want to start? <laughs> oh, really? Just the way any good movie or good story begins is like the beginning. So, where does your story begin? Where'd you grow up? Oh, well, I grew up in the Bay Area. Oh, nice. uh, East Bay Area, uh, Hayward, California, just uh, near Oakland. And I went to a high school there, and then I took a year. I went to San Jose State, and then I kept thinking I want to go down uh, to Hollywood and get in the movie business. And so then I came down to uh, Southern California, and I found an art school, which happened to be a great one. It's it's called Chenards. It's now Cal Arts, but they specialized in production design and art directing, and uh, and that's how I started. And then I had a uh, I needed a summer job because I didn't want to come back home. Uh, and it was sort of uh, and while I was in San Jose, I had I belonged to a fraternity, and I went up and I met a fraternity brother, and I said, "Yeah, I'm looking for a job," and he says uh, his. Uh, wife's father works at Disney. Why don't you give him a call? So I found out that Andy Ingman uh, was actually the guy who did all the hiring for the artists uh, at Walt Disney. And uh, he uh, he said, uh, you know, come and bring your portfolio. And I thought I was just going to get a job sweeping up or something, you know, for the <laughs> summer. Uh, and uh, so I brought my portfolio and he said, um, <clears throat> Well, you're too late for the training program, you know, for characters, Mickey Mouse and stuff. But there's an opening in special effects, uh, animated special effects. So uh, I said, OK, great. So they put me in this room with this with this lady. And uh, I said, what do I do? And I'm at this table with a, you know, a, a light uh, table. That you put your, your drawings with the three pegs on them. And uh, she said, you flip the pages and draw in between. So normally, just briefly at Disney, you start as a trainee, and then if you're, then you become a uh, in betweener, and you probably an in betweener for a year or two, and then if you move up, you become a breakdown artist, and then after many years, you become an assistant animator, and then on to animator. But that's you know years and years, and most of the people have been there for years, you know. Uh, but so this is a, a sort of a strange situation in that I was working for this woman and she was working for Dwight Carlisle, who was assisting Josh Metter. And Josh Metter was the top uh, effects animator. He did Night in Bald Mountain. He did The, the Fire in Bambi. Oh, okay. And he was, working, he was working on a special project uh, for uh, MGM called Forbidden Planet. And he was uh, drawing the id, animating the id uh, uh, in a technoscope papers, big white papers. And every frame had to be sort of rendered in pencil because they didn't want to do ink and paint and have that sort of animated line. So uh, anyway, uh, so she was working for this guy, uh, like Carlisle, who's working for the big timer. And anyway, she, after a few weeks, she had to leave for some reason. And she said, well, you just start working for, for Dwight. So now I'm working for the assistant to the guy that's, you know, doing this big MGM picture. And after about a, a month or so, he has to go to the hospital. Uh, 
Oh, wow. so now, now I'm 19 years old and I'm assisting this top animator and I'm drawing the id. So I, I ended up doing the id for, uh, for the, uh, uh, a forbidden Planet, you know, which had Robbie the Robot and all these yeah. sort of crazy things. So, uh, and then I stayed on and uh, I did, uh, I worked on uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty and I had the situation where I'm I'm drawing something on Sleeping Beauty, a pick cookie or something. This guy reaches over and corrects. He said, no, no, this is the way it should be. And I look up and it's Walt Disney. And he says, you know, like that. And that's the way Walt was, you know, you could be very friendly with him. So, uh, so that was my experience to start in the movie business and uh, did that for a couple of years, but I wanted to get into live action. What made you want to get into this? What growing up when you're in your teens, when did you fall in love and know like, Hey, you know what? I want to do like the art direction or I want to do drawing. Like what? Okay. I'll give you a basic really. Uh, I could always draw from the time I could remember uh, from oh, okay. the time uh, when I was uh, fourth or fifth grade, I remember for one class, I did all the dwarfs uh, about a foot uh, high, and we pasted them on the wall. So I was always uh, an artist, and I also played the piano uh, when I about, I think I started when I was 10 or something. So I was always interested in that and uh, in theater. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think... Uh, Basically, uh, this is a story I, I, I tell occasionally. I'll give it to you quickly. Uh, when I was, let's say, a teenager, 14, 15 years old, with a uh, girl that lived up the street a little bit, we'd go down to the movie theaters, Haywood Theater, uh, late Saturday, uh, early Saturday evening, and we saw American in Paris. And uh, I was just taken by that. We were just dancing on our way home, and then... I found out it, uh, they never shot it in Paris. The, the whole thing was shot in, in MGM, uh, the back lot, and stage 30. And then I found out who Cedric Gibbons and Preston Ames were these art directors, and they were responsible for making Paris look like Paris when it was on the back lot. And I thought, gee, that'd be a great thing. I'd love to do that. And, and then I figured, what, what do you have to do to be an art director? Well, you have to know how to draft, you know, architectural drafting. And if you could illustrate and draw, do storyboard stuff. So that's what I set out to do, uh, patterned myself after I learned what these uh, art directors did. And look, look at that. You see a movie at the age of, you know, 14, and then five years later, you're drawing and working on Forbidden Planet and Walt Disney's correcting you and... That's pretty wild. That's a quick transition, five years. Yeah, it, it was extremely, and I was very young because I got out of high school. Uh, I turned 17 the, the month I graduated. So I was pretty young for my first two years in uh, school after, you know, then I took classes uh, while I was at Disney at, at USC in special effects because I was interested in that. But uh, yeah, I was quite young. And, and then what happened is I needed to, after I left Disney, I really wanted to get into live action. And so I started working at a little theater, uh, designing sets. Uh, I do illustrations to present the set and then the drafting. And we, we built it. And I didn't make much money, but I, I, I got a good portfolio. Uh, and then a, a friend of the guy that runs the theater knew some people how I could get uh, an introduction to the, the union. Uh, and uh, they <laughs> evidently what they do is if uh, they're very busy um, and they need people, then they let you in. If they're not busy, then you can't get in. But it was a, a good time. And so I um, I walked around uh, from state studio to studio until I finally got a job at, uh, at a very small studio called Ziv. And they were doing Man in Space. Uh, and uh, early television kind of stuff. And this, you know, it would be 1960, I guess, 5960. Uh, and uh, so from there, I became a, a, a junior set designer, then a, a set designer. And I was, what, what they did is they, uh, you were last to be 
hired and the first to be fired as you until you got the seniority, you know. So I worked at uh, Fox on uh, a number of projects. At MGM, I worked on Mutiny on the Bounty, uh, working on the big boat, the Marlon Brando one. Oh wow! And then I and then I was to Fox and uh, worked on Magnificent Seven and My Fair Lady, you know. Just but I was in the uh, drafting room, but you know yeah. I was never on the set. I was just doing little details and stuff, and then. Eventually, uh, I got a job at Universal, and that became my home. And then I became a senior set designer and worked on uh, It's a Mad, Mad World. Oh, and really? Became, oh, yeah. Yeah, I worked on that. Was that the first time when you become a senior set designer? Are you, able, are you on set? Well, I, 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 they shot most of that on location in Palm yeah. Springs. But but I did go uh, to Stanley Kramer's office and you know talk to those people. Uh, the on set thing was next. I became assistant art director, and then you're you're on the set. Uh, you you start in the morning and you check the set out. Uh, you're there forty minutes before they start shooting to make sure everything's okay, nothing broke. Uh, and so I did some television shows and then I became a assistant art director and I worked on uh, torn curtain, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. I see that. Yeah. I see that on here. Yeah. So and then I had some, some nice conversations with Hitchcock and, uh, uh, it sort of developed that way. That was quite an experience for me. And what a great cast on torn curtain, Paul Newman. Jordan. Oh yeah. Uh, well, Paul Newman and I became friends uh, because he was interested in racing and I was, I used to race cars. You used to uh, race cars? And, yeah. I used to race formula cars like formula two. Whoa. And I did that for eight, eight years. And, uh, I won the Pacific coast championship in my class. And either way, Paul wanted to, uh, he said, I understand your race. And I said, yeah. He says, well, I've got this Volkswagen, one of the Porsche engine. And, uh, you know, is there any, place we could take and run it. I said, oh yeah, Willow Springs Raceway up there, you know, toward the Mojave Desert. So we went up there and uh, he raced around and then I put him in my formula car and he he, he said, uh, if Hitchcock knew I was doing this, he, he would sue me for a million dollars and he'd probably never work in this business again. And <laughs> anyway, uh, he went around, he was very fast and he eventually went off the road and collapse the front wheel of my car, but it was no big deal. Uh, but I, you know, I said, I think you should race. And, uh, he said, I think I'm a little, he's used the expression long in the tooth. He thought he was old. He was like 45 then, <laughs> but, uh, he, he, he then started racing. Cause then I did another movie uh, with him uh, called, uh, winning and, uh, with Bob Wagner and his wife, uh, uh Paul's wife. Anyway, <laughs> Um, he ended up racing until he was like 83, winning a lot of races. And then he died of cancer about the year later. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, my, probably my big break, uh, Doug, uh, was uh, becoming the art director uh, and getting uh, a series called Night Gallery uh, with Rod Serling. And uh, on Night Gallery, uh, we would have sometimes two, three directors each hour, different episodes. And so I got to meet a lot of directors. Um, and, uh, you know, Schwark, uh, who, who I got him hired on Jaws 2. And John Badham, who I ended up doing a number of projects with John. And then this young uh, director called Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Steven and I became friends. And... Uh, I ended up doing his uh, next three movies, uh, Serger Land, uh, Jaws, and Close Encounters. And so from there, uh, about, uh, so this was all in the studio when I was doing Jaws. It's pretty much, you're uh, part of the art department staff and you get getting paid, staff, uh, you know, basic uh, uh of wages, nothing outlandish. Um, and uh, so, but after Jaws, and then I did Close Encounters, and then it changed everything because it became more independent, not so much of the studio system. 
and I got an agent and, and so on close encounters that I got, uh, you know, three times what I was making on Jaws and then it just sort of escalates, you know, like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, after close encounters, which was a very big, uh, you know, I'd say jump in my, you know, I got nominated for Academy Award. I won I know, the that's, Academy Award. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, I, and I lost the Academy Award to Star Wars, uh, which was interesting because they were English art directors and I was now, I was up against them for the British Academy Award and they were English, but I won that one. So that is kind of was, funny. Well, it's interesting. I think, uh, cause, uh, Lucas came to our set and you couldn't believe it, it was the biggest set ever built inside at that time. And, uh, he, he said, we never built anything like this. We just repainted the same corridors, but the effects were so impressive. I think people were impressed by the visual, you know, yeah. of uh, all the effects. And uh, I think, and also, uh, it, it it was released in June, and ours was released in November. Uh, so we lost some of that uh, sort of that summer release thing, you know, uh, momentum. But um, basically, after that, then comes the sequel, uh, Jaws 2. So how quick after Jaws 1 did they go to you and say, hey, we want to do a second one? First of all, they had no, uh, let me put it this way. When we were on Jaws, we were over schedule and over budget. And, uh, and when we came back, we had a few shots we had to do because we did most everything in Martha's Vineyard on the East Coast. Yeah. And uh, so we had some, couple of shots we have to do local and then we ha we use the the ta the MGM tank uh, Esther Williams tank to do the underwater stuff uh so we came back we were we we're not heroes uh the studio wasn't really hot about doing this shark movie anyway and um Stephen didn't he wasn't that interested at first he wanted us to do a pirate movie and I was on it the very before Stephen I was on it uh David Brown, who uh, is uh, the Zanuck and Brown team, he's the literary guy, and, and he called me after Sugarland, and he said uh, that he had this this galley sheets of a book that's going to be released, and we're trying to see if they could sell it to make a movie, and if I could go through the, the book and pick out things to illustrate shark activity. So I did about... Uh, Oh, 25, 30 good size illustrations, shark illustrations of, of the shark and the shark activity. And, uh, I was going over and talk to Steven and he said, yeah, well, I'm not sure what's happening yet. And, uh, but if we do this, let, let's do a full size shark, you know, the biggest shark, 25 feet in the real ocean and, and no special tank and stuff like that. So that was the concept. And then we had a big meeting with all the heads of the production uh, departments and, uh, and production, art department, camera and whatever. And I presented my drawings. And uh, basically, uh, the effects people said they couldn't do it. They've never been a, never made a shark that big and never made it in the real ocean. And it would take a year and a half, two years. And so as I was leaving, the head of production, Marshall Green, said, uh, Joe, can you get the shark bait? And I said, uh, well, I certainly could try. So <laughs> I put together a set designer that was also an engineer, worked at Lockheed before. And I found Bob Maddy, who had made the giant squid in 20,000 leagues. I put a team together of about seven guys, and we started uh, the process of making the shark. Now, here's the problem is that that was uh, October, November of 73. The book came out in February 74. And uh, the studio said, we've got to start shooting this movie in three months. I said, what? You know, <laughs> I need a year, a year and a half to make the shark. No, no, we've got to take advantage of the popularity of the book. So basically, we started shooting in May, freezing cold. And the shark wasn't finished, you know. I mean, the guys were, were developing it. And so basically, I'd go to Stephen, and I did 
two hundred storyboards of the action of the shark. And yeah, I love those storyboards on your on your website. I'm going to put that in the link of the episode at Joe Al's movie art. You got to Doug. The book is coming out. In, I know. I'm going to put that on there too. I saw that December third. Yeah, and and not only does it have all the storyboards, but my writer was and I saved everything. It has a total script breakdown. Oh, of, sweet. At, of how you know, I, as I was reading it, and I made little sketches, so <clears throat> it's pretty complete. Uh, even uh, there was a note about that meeting with Marshall Green that I'm going to talk about, and the lady at the front desk at the art department said, "Meeting in Marshall's office per Jaws," and she had it on a little piece of paper. I kept all that stuff. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, well, thankfully you did. Well, yeah, I got all the drawings, all the concepts, uh, storyboards. So it's in the book. Uh, but so basically, th- this is a problem. Uh, and when I tell people, when people say, oh, the shark didn't work, well, of course it worked. Everything we wanted to get, uh, we got. Uh, it just, I would go to Bob Maddy and I said, what is working today? And he said, maybe the left to right shark. I'd go to Stephen, I said, with left to right, let's see what shots we could do. So Stephen said, okay, we'll do this one, that one. And so, if it worked, I said, we'll shoot it. If it's not, it's, it's a test because we didn't have the year to test it, you know? Yeah. So, and then people think that, well, because we use the barrel and the shark that we were doing it because the shark didn't work. No, that was sort of a Hitchcock thing. The barrels represented the shark. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, so you see the barrels come up and you say, oh, God, he's down there. Yeah. So that was more more mysterious, you know, than showing the shark like they do today so many times, you know. Yeah, I know. The, when you don't see it the, as much, I think Stephen did that so well. And yeah. we with him on this. And if you think Jurassic Park, you think that's yeah. a dinosaur movie, but you really, the dinosaurs are only on screen, I think, for like 11 minutes. So, no, well, you're right. Yeah, and so Stephen and I went over, we did, I did like 200 storyboards. So we planned every shot with the shark when it would be important to use it. When the, you know, when Shida was, you know, chumming and it comes up, boom, and then breaking through the cabin and stuff like that. So it had an impact. We didn't have to see it all the time, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, that takes me up to, uh, let's see, after close encounters at uh, Jaws two. And, uh, so your, your, your answer, your question was, when did they start thinking about it? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Uh, as I say, they were not in favor of this movie. We were over schedule, over budget. Um, and uh, they had a screening in, in Texas, which I, was, I didn't go to. And Stephen came back. He says, I got four screens, screams. I think I could... Uh, get five but i need a couple things and so the the movie had wrapped the studio didn't so he asked me if i could build a piece of the hall which i did in my backyard and we shot one sequence in my driveway of the shark hitting the boat when it says show me the way to go home boom boom and we have water spittling into the hall and we did that in the backyard and then that was in your backyard yeah (laughs) <laughs> and then, I mean, we, nobody knew we were doing this. So we, we Stephen got the the camera somewhere, and and then we 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 got the the head, uh, the fisherman's head, uh, from the makeup department, and I made another hole with a hole, and, we, and in the uh, editor's swimming pool, we you know when Dreyfus goes down and you see the head in the hole of the ship. Yeah, a scary. Th- yeah, well, we did that in in the a swimming pool, the editor's swimming pool. Studio didn't know we were doing this, and then we had the, the dailies, <coughs> and they said we can't have dailies. Jaws has been over with. So anyway, they were a little upset, but then they cut it in, and we had a screening in uh, Lakewood, uh, in the L.A. area here, and uh, it was it was amazing. They we. I always thought basically that people might laugh at the shark because you used to make all these strange noises. And so after we would be finished with the shark shot, the crew would laugh at it, you know, but take away that sound and put John Williams music and all that stuff. They, they weren't, they weren't laughing. No, my parents were scared to go into the water after they saw it. 
Well, they went crazy. The audience went crazy. And so sitting behind me was Lou Rossman, president of Universal, and uh, and uh, uh, Sid Scheinberg and all these executives. And they went into the men's room and they re- they said, we've got to re-release this thing. I mean, we've got to release this thing in a big, wide summer release. But that was the first time ever anybody did that. Really? It was like 450. Yeah. Because they used to just release them slowly, but th- that was the big. I mean, then it was four hundred fifty theaters. Now it's four thousand. Yeah. So <laughs> that that changed that changed the whole summer release process, and it made his money back in a couple of days. You know, uh, even with three hundred three dollar and fifty cent tickets. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so basically. Uh, that went on. Then we did Close Encounters. And so then Zanuck and Brown still owned the rights to that. And they approached me about uh, about designing it. And uh, I had an agent at this time. And uh, the deal was they would, he said, no, Joe will design it, but he wants to be a social producer. And he also wants to direct the second unit. So they agreed to that. And they asked me if I could go to Stephen and talk to Stephen about doing it. And Stephen said something about he would do it for a certain price, but he was going to do this picture called 1941. Yeah. And, uh, and he asked me if I could do 1941 and I, and said, Jaws too. Um, and I said, yeah, I'll go with you. But he didn't have a deal. He said, no, I don't have a deal yet. You know? So when you don't have a deal, you don't, you know, and you got another offer that's going to call, you know, give you something you never had, producing, oh, yeah. designing, directing. So I, um, I, I went with them, and it was a different uh, situation because now I'm part of uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the whole part of the movie, the casting and uh, story and all that, and the art direction and directing the second unit, which is uh, the action stuff that detailing that the director, you know, uh, would, you know, would go on and work with the principals and then you'd come follow through and maybe do some cuts of the shark doing stuff, things like that. Did so you I always want to direct? Um, that's interesting. When I did direct on Jaws, uh, what happened was, uh, we were ready to wrap, and there was a sequence where the shark, uh, it, the little boy, kitten boy, is on a, a little raft. Yeah. And and the shark uh, comes up and, and eats him. And so Stephen was anxious to get back home and start cutting and working on the sound and everything, and the music. So he said, uh, could you direct that sequence? Well, I've been doing all the storyboards, so I know shot for shot what to do. So... Uh, I directed uh, that sequence, uh, and it was complicated because I had a shark, I had kids in the foreground, and I had a dummy on a raft. So when they asked me to do us too, I thought, well, yeah, I'd like directing second unit. So, yeah, that got me interested in doing it. That's awesome. And what was it like? Obviously, the first one, you had everyone there. You had uh, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, you had Robert Shaw, you had Roy Schneider, and then just in the second one, you have Roy Schneider. Are any of those stories true about like the, the shoot with him that he didn't really want to do the movie and he was just doing it because he was under contract? He didn't want to do the sequel. This is yeah. true. Yeah. And, and what, what happened was um, I had uh, just finished Close Encounters and they uh, had hired a director, John Hancock, and um, he was starting to, this is, he started to get involved with stuff he shouldn't have, but like how the shark works and telling Bob Maddie, you know, you know, to do this and that, who, you know, and uh, so what happened basically is the first shark we made off this studio lot, because I was going to do independence. The effects department of the studio didn't, you know, said they take too long, blah, blah. So I did it away. And the whole process of sharks cost us $250,000. When I started on Jaws, they've been working on the new shark at, at the studio, and they already spent two million uh, because you're at the studio, and they put charges on this 
movie that was very successful. So they figured, oh, they could keep charging money. So John Hancock got involved with that. Uh, we went to the location back in, uh, and I got involved with him in looking at the location, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, he's a very nice guy. But he had some problems uh, the first week of directing. Um, and so I said, well, let me go shoot some walk walk and talk things uh, around the vineyard just to establish a second unit. And he, he but uh, he was, he had some problems. And uh, so I, I said, okay, well, I'm going to go down to Florida. That's where we're going to shoot all the water stuff because the water, there was not as much boat traffic. And I, I discovered that on Close Encounters that if we did Jaws 2, I'd like to do the water stuff in in Florida near uh, Pensacola. So, oh, okay. <clears throat> well, you know, because what I problem I had with Close Martha's Vineyard is when I scouted it, the the, the bay that we we're going to use uh, was beautiful and it was empty, but there was snow on the on the beach in the summer. There suddenly there's thousands of boats that are hundreds of boats anyway. They're coming from Hyannis Port, so that that was a big problem for us yeah. with the boat traffic and the people. So I said, if we do it too, I'd like to do it in Florida, and there was no, nobody out there, so. That worked out. Anyway, I found out they, they they fired John, and they were going to cancel the movie. And uh, then the, the studio said, well, how about uh, Joe and Verna Fields, who won the Academy Award for editing Jaws, <coughs> well, you co-direct it, but the Directors Guild wouldn't let you do that. If you start in one position, like a cameraman, and they fired the director, you can't become the director. It's uh, So... So then there, uh, I came up with uh, Jiro Schwark, who did a number of night galleries, and I, I always thought he had good ideas. And uh, and so anyway, they hired him. So then we we started the movie again. Uh, so we were, we did everything in Navarre Beach, Florida, <clears throat> and uh, so the fact now we're behind schedule. So. He would work with the principals. He had a very, very difficult time with Roy. Roy was um, just didn't want to do the movie. But uh, anyway, they dealt with it. Uh, we had all those kids on the boat. And, and I did a lot of shots with the shark. And it was shark attacking the helicopter and shark, uh, you know, breaking the <clears throat> the transom of the boats and things like that. So. Uh, so it ended up being um, a long process, uh, probably, I think, 85 days of second unit. and uh, But we struggled through it. And then the picture came out, and it was uh, very successful. At that time, the biggest grossing you know, sequel, I think, at the time. Yeah, I'm sure. And the movie, that, like I told you, our podcast, like I love talking about movie sequels because they're a unique like monster to try to tackle because there's so many directions you can go in. I think with this one, it was it was great because you you know the the stakes were kind of you know risen. You know the kids were older, uh, Martin's kids. Yeah. They were in trouble, and you had the helicopter and the shark taking taking that out. And uh, that was an interesting thing when I saw when I read that the helicopter, I thought, oh, that's that sounds pretty silly. Uh, <laughs> and and then I researched and I found a Bell helicopter with the pontoons on it. And I looked at it and I said, gee, if that thing lands on the water, those pontoons are going to look like, like a seal, Yeah. you know, from, from uh, the shark's point of view. And, uh, you know, with all the, uh, a shark would probably go after those pontoons. It's, it's gone after surfboards and things like that. Cause that shape looks like a, you know, a big, big seal. Uh, so I directed that sequence uh, and it was, it was tricky as hell. And we had to make a special helicopter with uh, blades that would break and stuff. So that was difficult. And then uh, just that went on and on, you know, shooting boats, trying to get all of these boats together. You know, some were, uh, you know, different kind of uh, catamarans and sloops and stuff. And they don't sail at the right speed, the same speed. So it was... Uh, it was a long shoot, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, 
and 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 uh, Janot really had his problems with Roy, but we got it done and and it worked. And then uh, that was it. I was sort of finished with with sharks uh, and shark movies. Uh. How how did you think it turned out? Like the first time you saw it, like the full movie. I I, I you know after struggling with it, you know I mean I worked on it for God I can't tell you how long, year and a half. Uh, and I, I was shooting stuff in the winter when everybody went home. I had Roy's boat uh, crash, and I, I did that. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I was pleased with it. Let me say that. Uh, you know, and the audience seemed to be pretty pleased with it. There was a lot of activity, you know, and the kids worked. Uh, they, they were quite good. So, yeah, I think it worked out pretty good. Uh, there were... Um, some shots I would have done differently, but uh, they cut it a little bit different. And then it was cut and recut because the, the, I had so much of my stuff. The director cut a lot of it out. But then the editor, Verna Fields, who's now a vice president at Universal, she put it back in. And so it was a good balance. Uh, so, so I was pretty pleased with that. But then um, let's see. Then Yeah, then I went off on uh, after that, I think. Uh, Escape from New York. Well, yeah, but you know what happened was I really wanted to do this race movie because of uh, my eight years racing cars. So oh, I yeah. had this thing called uh, Out in Front, and I had Jim Brolin. I interviewed Jim Brolin. I had an older driver, younger driver. Dennis Quaid is younger, and I've been talking to John. And so I went off and I scouted um, all over Europe racetracks, uh, and I was going to direct it. And I came back, and uh, the um, studio that was going to do it got bought by somebody else, and so they canceled everything. So uh, then my agent said, I think you better, you better go back to work. So he says, I want to introduce you to um, uh, these young filmmakers, uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. And so then I, I met them, and we did Escape from New York, and... Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a really fun group of people, and I think I think it came out pretty good. It was quite different in this respect, Doug, is that they had been making uh, small movies like Halloween and uh, yeah, uh, and they were you know like three hundred thousand dollar movies. You, you know is what their big budget was, and so I'm coming off of Close Encounters and stuff like that, and Jaws too. So our, it took a while to get the, the thinking together. Uh, but this budget, they have like six million, so we had a little bit more to play with than they normally did. And uh, John was was fun to work with, really laid back guy. And Deborah Hill, we became good friends. Uh, so, so that was that was good a good experience. And uh, then what happened is I had a movie after that. Uh, Zanica Brown wanted me to do a picture called The Ninja. Irv Kirshner was directing. It was all set in New York, so. I moved moved to New York, and I was there for seven months uh, doing The Ninja. It was a number one bestseller. Uh, and, uh, but Kirsten kept rewriting it, and we went and we scouted Japan and did all that. So I actually started building sets, and then uh, it was a Fox movie, and Fox got bought out oh, by man. some guy. And uh, they canceled all the movies. So, uh, did you keep anything uh, from that? No. Uh, oh, I have illustrations. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Oh no, I got a lot of illustrations because what we were doing is we needed to do Japan, and I said I could do Japan in uh, part of the Bronx. There it was a, an area they were tearing down. So, uh, but basically, I came back, and I'd go see Verna Fields, who was now vice president hang out of her office, and she said, you know, Joe, they they were doing this thing, uh, Jaws 3, People 0, uh, and basically uh, uh, they were going to make fun, like Animal House, they were going to make fun of uh, the people that made Jaws. And I said, God, that seems bad taste. Uh, you know, their they're biggest grossing movie, and they're going to make fun of the people that made it. So... Uh, that went on for some time, Verna said. That was, uh, um, and uh, from what I heard, you know, this is just hearsay. Stephen went to uh, Scheinberg, was the head 
their president and said, uh, if you make this, then I won't do anything with Universal. I now, read that too. Just, okay. So that was hearsay. And, uh, but yeah. So they got rid of it. And Alan Landsberg, who was a television producer, that's incredible and that kind of stuff. She said, why don't you talk to him? Uh, they're going to do this Jaws three, uh, you know, thing over there. So I went to talk to him and basically, um, he said, well, I'll let you produce it. I said, no, either I direct it or I don't, I'm not interested, you know. He said, well, why don't you go scout some locations with the writer um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it later. So I went to Florida and um, with the writer uh, and uh, we looked at a number of theme parks and one of them had a, an underwater film of going through the tide pools and it was just beautiful and it was in 3d and uh so i came out and they said what's the matter what are you thinking uh making a movie in 3d i said no jaws 3d it sort of takes the onus off the third by making it a, a 3d yeah. and yet it's still jaws 3d so there's sort of a play on on the word you know and so when i got back and i uh, actually what happened was i still have the sketch too it was, Thanksgiving at my sister's house in Lake Tahoe, I did a, a a sketch of a shark coming at you, and it was 3D, 3D, 3. And I showed it to Landsberg when I got home, and he's, he says, oh, this is great. Let's show it to Universal. So we showed it to Sid, and he said, can I have this? I said, of course. But well, he just wanted to take it to Lou Wasserman. They came back. Okay, we're going to do Jaws 3D, and you can direct. So... That's the whole thing. That's how it happened. Was it a lot more difficult shooting in 3D because the way everything oh, shot? Oh, God. Oh, so first of all, we didn't have new cameras. Uh, and I got Jimmy Connor was a really good cameraman. We had to shoot with old cameras. I said to <clears throat> John Landsberg, I said, no, we got uh, Aeroflex making us some new 3D small cameras. We should wait. Until, no, no, we're going to start shooting. So we started shooting what we called the Ultra Jam because it was ultra camp, but it was jammed all the time. So we shot a week with that, and then we got our new cameras, and so we had to just throw that week away because it didn't work with the other new camera system. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it was three difficult with 3D because not only the convergence, what you're working with when you're shooting, it's when you're projecting it, every projectionist has to adjust the you know the images together because you've got two images that have to slide together so uh so we had some problems theatrically through the theater's system that some of them didn't take the time to adjust it so people would eyes would hurt but it was a the the other big thing i had a problem is that we took a normal 35 millimeter film and i cut it in half so the top section was left eye, bottom section was right eye. Now I, I had a format that was extremely wide, like uh, cinema ramble or cinema scope, you know, big yeah. white. So then you have to balance all that negative space, you know. But um, when you were in charge of this movie, how quick were you? Like, you know, what? I want to work with Dennis Quaid because you already had him in that other picture that because the studio bought out. Was that your decision to bring well, him? Well, he, he, no, actually not. Uh, Alan Landsberg had done something with Quaid and, oh, okay. uh, and I had seen Quaid uh, and I had thought about him on that bicycle movie. So that was good. Uh, uh, we bought a producer from New York, Rupert Hitzik. He, he liked Bess, Bess Armstrong. And then there was this little girl, young girl that came in interviewed and I liked her a lot. Uh, Leah Thompson. And they said, no, oh, they weren't too crazy about it. Then we went to New York to uh, to cast and uh, she shows up again, you know. Oh, I thought you guys want to see me, you know. She's incredible, you know. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, I said I really like her, and they said okay, if, if you like her, you got it. And so that was her first part ever, <laughs> and um, so that that worked good with John Putch, uh, a, a good relationship the two of them, and uh, so. Uh, I had no problems. Uh, then uh, Lou Gossip was a, a big thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, because uh, 
that came up. And and the big thing was that uh, here's a black man playing the head of SeaWorld, and SeaWorld uh, didn't hire a lot of uh, African American people. Uh, oh, there was so, like a big thing about that back then. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, actually, I got nominated for an NAACP award, uh, but uh, because I, I had used him in a major, a black man in a major role, but uh, I think um, George Lucas won for uh, some other movies the same year. But anyway, uh, but it was great, and and. Uh, and Lewis uh, was good. He he knew his lines all the time, and it was uh, <coughs> Dennis was uh, a little. Uh, it, it, it would take him a, a little while to get into the scene. We we have to do a couple of takes before he would uh, get into it. Uh, Bess Armstrong was very consistent, uh, so that wasn't my problem. And Landsberg was my problem. Basically, he wanted to run the show and uh the first day of shooting he he's there trying to give me shots and i said well no no i'm the director this uh, well yeah but do this do that you know finally i had a uh, first assistant scott maiden who was like six five big guy i said just <laughs> keep alan away while i get my shots done you know <laughs> it, it, it worked out but the big problem in the end is uh the problem I have when I see the movie is I cut the movie uh, to two hours and three minutes, exactly like Jaws 2 and Jaws. Uh, Alan and the studio felt if they could cut it down by 25 minutes, they could get five screenings a day at the theaters instead of four. So they just arbitrarily, I didn't have final cut. They ended up cutting about 25 minutes out of the movie of my personal relationship things. Do you understand? Yeah. Like, so that was a little disturbing. Uh, so there were some great scenes that I had that they just cut out because they wanted to expedite the film. And you can't do anything about it unless you're, you know, big time director where you have final cut. So they wanted to... Um, I guess because it's 3D and it was a big deal and they wanted to rush it out and get as many screenings uh, as they could because then they had another 3D movie that they wanted to to show after Jaws. So they, they cut – Jaws made – Jaws 3 made a, a lot of money in the first oh, couple lot, of weeks. Yeah. Uh, and, and and then they, they pulled it much too soon because they wanted something else in 3D out there. So, so – in the end, it was a, sort of a negative thing for me because though the movie was extremely successful, <coughs> and I still have a, a fan base uh, all over the world. Uh, I got one in France that keeps sending me information. Big collectors of Jaws three. Oh, that's uh, awesome! But but the critics the critics tend to really beat up on sequels. Uh, they did then uh, and. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, there, I think there might have been a Rocky three, but uh, we were one of the first, you know, second sequels, and the critics weren't too good. But the critics didn't particularly like close uh, two, and they really didn't get great reviews on Jaws. When you go back and look at it, the critics said, "Oh, it's a shark movie." It was a shark movie that lives still lives today. You know? Oh yeah, I mean, forty five years later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Doug. In the mail today, I got two, two things about would you sign this shark or would you send it to? And yesterday, I had one. Uh, another thing about they they sent me pictures of the shark or something, and and uh, and that's forty five years ago. I'm still getting this kind of response, you know. I know. I'm going to be ordering. I want to get one of your uh, signed storyboards. I'm going to pick one out. Oh, okay. They're pretty All cool. Right. Good. Yeah, awesome. I did a bunch. So. Anyway, when you see the book, they're, they they got a, they're they're all in there. Oh, that's so. cool. So yeah, like you mentioned before, like that's why I love movie sequels because I think people do the wrong thing, even when TV shows that have follow ups, because yeah. they look at the first movie and then they compare the second to the first or the third to the first, and that's just not fair because they're different no. movies. No, it's a to totally different movie. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, 
Last year uh, in Catalina Island, uh, they had uh, a Jaws exhibit uh, in their museum, and it ran for six months. And uh, I had all my drawings, my originals, and other ones. And, and Greg Nicotero, who does The Walking Dead, he has a big prosthetic company that builds creatures and stuff. And yeah. he made the three, the three characters so incredibly real with hair on their arms and stuff. And they're standing on the stern of the boat. And uh, so you walk into the thing, you see my drawings, you see a, a shark head that he had made. And uh, so you walk around and you see all that. And then there's the, the cage, the original cage. So that thing ran for six, six months, you know, and we, we sold an early copy of the book that's coming out uh, there at the island. And so it, anyway, uh, what happened was it was an evening screening outside in a big, big theater, uh, but not big, big screen. And uh, they're going to show it. And I was going to say, well, okay, I've seen it before. And, but then the, the lady head of the museum said, and then Joe's going to talk about it afterwards. So <laughs> my, my wife had saved me a seat. So we sat there and we watched it. And I hadn't seen it for years, Doug. And, and so now I'm watching it without thinking about, is the shark working? Does this look good? And I was just absorbed into the movie. And, and the third act with the, the characters were so good. I mean, oh. the relationship between uh, Dreyfus and Shaw, and they're just at each other, you know, the, the pompous, you know, kid and the old grumpy salesman. And then <laughs> This cop that doesn't want to be there at all, you know, I mean, what the hell am I doing on a boat? <laughs> and I realized it's a hell of a good movie. Oh, it's you a know? phenomenal it's, movie. It's, so it's it's not just a shark, you know. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, there's three guys who have a problem and there's a thing out there that wants to get them, you know. And so that's basically it. And then the other ones, we had to do a total different thing. We... We, we we got all the kids. We brought back, you know, the the kids uh, younger on the boats, and so that there was that tie in, and uh, and then and we had you know uh, Scheider, but then the third one was years later. The guys are grown up, so it's, it's still the two boys, and uh, it's a different thing. We're in a theme park, you know, and. So there, it, you're right. There, there are different movies. You, you know, it's it, it doesn't. You know, if it led into the next day, you know, after Jaws, yeah. if after Dreyfus and, and Scheider swam to the shore, and then you pick them up getting the shore, and then Dreyfus goes off and does something, and Scheider has another problem. That you know, then then you could you know see the. But anyway, uh, it's different. No, definitely. So, so the next year, one movie that you worked on was Starman, and I know you were talking about Nicotero before, but you worked with uh, Rick Baker. Yeah, the thing what, what happened uh, on Starman is uh, basically after I did Just Three, uh, I started developing projects, and I went through uh, a lot of scripts and studios. And I, it, it's it's no different that, uh, than it is today. It's really difficult to get a movie made. Yeah. You know, uh, unless you're a big timer. And even sometimes, you, you know, uh, I'm sure Stephen doesn't have any problems or a few people like that. But a lot of, you know, well-known people don't get another movie again. If you look at it, some directors have been years. So <clears throat> I had projects out there. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then I scouted a couple, and then you no, know, uh, then they canceled it. And so, so then finally, uh, Carpenter called me and asked me if he uh, or I would do Starman. And I said, Well, you know, <coughs> I'm really interested in directing, but um, what I'll do is uh, I'll do I'll do a visual consultant uh, and uh, I'll direct a second unit for you. So he, he said, great. And so they brought an art director in that worked for me on Close Encounters, Danny Lamino. So he was a production designer. But I laid out a lot of stuff visually. There was a rocket ship and all that stuff. So I did preliminary uh, drawings. And then I went off uh, 
and and did uh, the the car uh, when uh, what's his name uh, the the star we, we were a second unit of, of the car going from where uh, he comes down and he comes through Monument Valley and all of a sudden yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah Jeff Bridges yeah Jeff Bridges so it wasn't Jeff but it was supposed to be Jeff driving all the way to uh, where this um, uh, uh, the big vo- uh, volcano uh, or you know crater and uh, and then I designed a spaceship that comes down and I, I worked with L- ILM on that and they didn't do it quite the way I wanted it it was sort of a compromise uh, so that basic basically uh, was happened on uh, Starman and then there are other projects John ha- had he was going to do uh, Gosh, a couple other things which I I broke down and did you know breakdowns and stuff, but it didn't. Uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. He was going to redo that. Oh, really? That'd that be did, cool. Yeah, but then that didn't happen. But I did a breakdown, and uh, so yeah, and then Stephen wanted me to do something, but we, we, the connection was it didn't happen. Uh, Et. I was doing something else, but he had called me, um, and and then uh, you, you know your career goes on. Uh, directing jobs were hard to get, and uh, <coughs> I can I think that I kept trying until I then I did a uh, uh, thing with Taylor Hackford, uh, and um, you've worked with some heavy yeah. hitters. When you look back at your career, like I've interviewed a lot of directors. And people that have worked in film, and but every movie you've done, like production design towards uh, in like '97, you worked with Steven Seagal, you worked with Wesley Snipes, you worked with Emilio Estevez and Mick Jagger and uh, Free Jack. Oh, me, ja- yeah. I got to tell you, this this is interesting, just for a career thing. I worked uh, Elvis Presley's last movie, Forbid uh, Change of Habit. Oh, cool. So. Uh, I was assistant art director and, and Mary Tyler Moore would get really upset because he would show up late and he wouldn't know his lines and he had this big entourage around him so you couldn't even talk to him. Then he'd come there and didn't know the lines and she'd get upset. Anyway, so that was Elvis. Uh, years later, I'm working with Mick Jagger and I figured, uh, well, you know, he's a big star. He's not going to be accessible. And he was the nicest guy. And he, he had this uh, where Academy Awards uh, screening and uh, television thing. He said, Joe, come to the house, bring your wife. So uh, we spent the, the evening with him and his wife uh, uh, watching the Academy Awards and a couple of the people. But just, you know, really relaxed, low-key guy, wasn't stoned or anything. Not at all what he pre- presents on the stage. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I interviewed uh, his one of his bodyguards for when he used to tour in Australia, this guy that was a martial artist. And he yeah. told me cool stories about him. And he said, like, you think this guy was like this big party animal? He would party, but at the same time, he'd wake me up at 4 o'clock in the morning and show him how to karate chop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he was into the business a- aspect of it, too. So he's a very, very smart guy. We, we had a, a good relationship uh, and he was he was a lot of fun. Uh, Steven Seagal, uh, not so much. Very nice to me. I built a lot of sets, huge sets. I built, we, we had a, a thing where he, he has to go into this casino. And I said, you know, okay, well, we'll, we'll shoot it in the casino. Oh, no, no. He won't go in a casino because there's smoke in the atmosphere, you know, bad for him. So I, I said to the, I flew back, we were back east in Kentucky. Flew back, talked to the executives of Warner Brothers. I said, it's going to cost a million dollars if I build a set for, you know, a, a casino. It's a big <laughs> set. And, uh, well, yeah, so we built the casino. And, but uh, you know, he would show up uh, like I built this cabin uh, up in uh, <clears throat> the hills up in Kentucky. And uh, it was just beautifully green. But when Kentucky changes seasons, it becomes red and orange and just and so it was all green and uh, the cabin and a beautiful view. Uh, and we, we have an eight o'clock, seven for eight shoots. He should be there by, and make up by seven and shoot by eight. He'd show up at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Jesus. You know, and uh, 
So that that was a problem, and I, I you know, told the executives. I said, "Look, if Stephen, uh, you know, we delay this much more, the whole back background is going to change color. You know, it's <laughs> not going to be green; it's going to be red nor." So anyway, we, we did wrap. Then we went to L.A., and I had to make L.A. look like Kentucky uh, because he wants to come back home. So he's, he, you know, he pretty much is self-focused, uh, unlike uh, you know some big stars I worked with. I worked with Rock Hudson uh, and uh, on a thing called Embryo, big big star in, in the fifties. Just the nicest guy you could believe. Just the nicest guy. Had a big you know, party when we wrapped and went to his house and Paul Newman was a great guy. And then you get, you know, the, the Seagulls and people like that. Or just, I know uh, from what I've heard, cause I've interviewed a bunch of people that have worked with him. That's why I wanted to ask you anyway. And it's all been the yeah. same thing. I've interviewed people that have worked with him. Like I interviewed William Sadler and he worked with him yeah. in hard to kill. And that's going to think if you look at the Steven Seagal, like his filmography, that's like in the beginning. And then I interviewed yeah. a couple of his directors, for his direct DVD movies that he does now, same yeah. thing from the beginning. And from what I heard was with him, his first movie, he like went to the lot. I don't know what studio it was, but he did like a demonstration, like a karate demonstration. And whoever yeah. was in charge then loved him and gave him like a big movie. And his first movie did so well. So he didn't yeah. have to like work his way up. Like a lot of the people. That you no. with. So he's always been that high. So I guess it just gave him an ego. Yeah, and then just uh, some people are just self-focused. They, yeah. they think about themselves, uh, and uh, not, you know. And, and you get people like Meryl Streep, who just couldn't be nicer, you know, who's brilliant, and uh, other people, you know, that are really they're they're in the business. They know that they're supposed to be there on time, and they know they're supposed to know their lines. And if they have a problem with with the dialogue, they discuss that with the director, work that out. But. <clears throat> Yeah, I, you know, by and large, um, most of the people have been pretty good, but uh, uh, Seagal was a little difficult. Uh, but uh, yeah, and that was, that, I got to tell you, uh, the uh, the Seagal movie, uh, Fire Down Below, yeah. I think is some of my best art directions. I mean, I had the casino, uh, I, I built uh, 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 this church that we bl uh, burned down I built a little lake that reflected I did this cabin and we just we did a, a lot of good work and he was very thankful he he did say uh, afterward Joe it was a beautiful job you did and blah 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 uh, so he was he, he was okay w with me but the fact that he would just show up so late it would really be hard on this the schedule and the, and the you know the director you know but yeah and you know think all these movies you've done I'm looking at like I've never seen the movie uh, Shadow Conspiracy, but everyone in that movie is like a heavy hitter, actor-wise. Like Donald Sutherland, yeah. Charlie Sheen, yeah. Linda Hamilton, Stephen Lang. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I, uh, yeah the right. director. I had a problem with that director, uh, George Cosmatis. Uh, he was uh, just a difficult man. Uh, he would. Uh, he just had an attitude. You know, uh, he would come in and look at my set and say, how, how do I shoot this? I don't know this, how, what, what am I doing? You know, and I said, well, George, you bring the guy in here, don't tell me how to direct, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is terrible. Anyway, then at the end of the day, he would call me over, he said, oh, Joe, this is fantastic. I love what you do. I said, why don't you shout that out now? You know, he, he'd always start the day with shouting and bad and everything's not good. Ugh. And then at the end of the day, it would be, oh yeah, you did a great job. And so, <laughs> I never worked with him again, but uh, <laughs> that was anyway. So, so just a couple more questions before I let you go. Yeah. Obviously you loved doing art and you were such a great drawer at such a young age. Do you think if you didn't, you know, get to where you were, if that person wasn't sick that day and everything didn't happen, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Do you think you still would have went into the film industry or was there something else? There really wasn't anything. I was uh, sort of, okay. What I did I majored in architecture and minored in drama. So um, in college, I, I, I did do a little part in, the, in a play, but I wasn't a very good actor. But uh, I, I did direct the senior extravaganza in high school. So I, I put a thing together. So I was into theater. Uh, so 
And in architecture, uh, so I, I might have got a job drafting somewhere if, if it wasn't. But I did get a job drafting sets. That's how I started. So uh, if, if it would have been something like that, maybe for some uh, architectural firm or s s nature. But it, it would have to do with art or architecture, you know. No, that's so cool. Uh, that's cool that you directed then and then you got to do it. You know, down the road. And uh... well, when I talk to, I do lectures, you know, sometimes the young people. And uh, I, I, what I say to them when they're young, I said, look, at, decide what you want to do. Find out how to do it. And then realize if you're not going to do it, somebody's going to do it. You know, so uh, at least pursue it. You know, I mean, I have one daughter who who's uh, graduated uh, in the... Uh, and Boston Art Institute, Magna Cum Laude. She was number one in her class, and, and she does uh, animation for some, uh, you know, online uh, cartoon stuff. And oh, really? Another That's one, cool. yeah. And so she keeps working. The other one it, it wants to be an actress, and she's done a couple of small movies, but it, it's really, really difficult. Uh, so. Uh, but she does, you know, stuff, dramatic stuff. So they, they're interested. And um, so, yeah, you just, you have to try to decide where, where you want to go and how do you get there and what do you have to know to get there. And, and that's when I, going back to the uh, American in Paris, when I thought, that's not Paris. Uh, it's... People making it look like Paris, that sounds like a pretty good thing. You know, it's like doing a Viking ship, you know, creating different things. And, uh, you know, you start with nothing and, and you, you're going to do uh, a Western town. OK, what do I do? What does it look like? Uh, well, it looks like this and that. And, you know, you start researching. I used to do we used to have uh, research departments and you go and say, I'm going to do this. Give me all the books you can on Western, you know buildings uh, that period now you could pretty much google all, all yeah. that stuff you know you know it's it, it, it's quite different uh, the, the whole system has changed people art directors uh, production designers don't draw as much as they you know, some of them don't know how to draw yeah. they get online and they find stuff and they say oh build something that looks like this or maybe something like that where before we would start with a blank piece of paper and say, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm going to do uh, a sheriff's office. Now, let's see what, what would it have, you know, blah, 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 like yeah. that. And because uh, I, I did a, a series called uh, Heck Ramsey, uh, Richard Boone, and uh, I, I did a sheriff's office, and it, but it was in 1903. So it was a, it was a change from a sheriff's office to a precinct. You know, so it was a combination of both. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the, the sheriff wore der a derby cat, like hats and, and black suits and, 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 uh, Boone was still an old uh, sheriff with a big cowboy hats and boots. So, so it's anyway, you, you research this stuff and say, oh, okay, this is Western town, but wait a minute, it's 1903. So occasionally there's a car that goes by or, you know, so y you have to, research it, detail it out, and then uh, you draw it and start building it. You know? And I think it's so cool that you did so many different types of movies too. You got like Close Encounters, Jaws, and then you do something futuristic like Free Jack yeah. and Free from New York. So it's really cool that you're able to work on so many different things. And like you said, you saw that. Yeah, movie. It, was, it was fun. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I was going to say, I saw an interview with you and somebody asked you if you're going to write a book. And I really hope you do because you've worked on amazing pictures. You've done amazing work and you worked with some amazing people. And I'm sure you have stories about each and every well, one. Well, actually, the Den uh, Dennis Prince, who wrote the Jaws book that's coming out, wrote my whole biography. Oh, awesome. Uh, he went, yeah, what happened was we, we met each other on uh, a show because uh, he had written uh, Aurora uh, model making book and we were flying back. We flew back together and he was saying about doing a Jaws book and stuff. I said, well, they've been Jaws book. And then he, he left his job 
So he had a year. So I have all these tapes uh, just over the years of different things that I did. So he wrote the biography starting with the, the Disney thing all, all the way up. And so, but then the Catalina thing came so that we, he wrote the Jaws book and then we also wrote a book on Close Encounters. Uh, but we ran out of, uh, we had to publish that ourselves because uh, Sony uh, wanted to get involved and they didn't want us to do this and that. But anyway, so there is a book that we're trying to find a publisher for. Sweet. And I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, we'll see how, how well the, the Jaws book does. I'm sure and, it's going to do great. That movie stands the test of time. Well, the thing, Doug, about my biography is that I really didn't want it about me so much as about the period, the studio system, how, how the six or seven major studios, how you got knocked around until you found a home, and then you were a staff guy, and then they used to give you the work, and then the studio system broke up, and then you had to get, a, get an agent, and you had to go. It, it was just different, so it, it's like really... Uh, showing the transition of time of working with Hitchcock and how that differs, you know, with somebody Walt else. You know, so, you know, like that's so Walt cool. Disney. all the people that you yeah. have all these interactions with. Joe is so great. I could have talked to him for hours about his career. Don't forget to buy his book, Designing Jaws, and check out his signed artwork at joealvesmovieart.com. Again, all the links are in the notes. Well, there you have it. Now your job is to go watch Jaws 2 because that's the next film that me and Jamie are talking about. I just watched Jaws, and man, that is such a perfect movie. So we'll see what the second one has in store. Subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to review, rate, and share our podcast. Follow us on social media at Sequels Only. Good night. <laughs>